You're listening to Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. Welcome to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show, a weekly radio program that spotlights positive real estate development and neighborhood revitalization throughout Philadelphia. I'm your host, Derek Hengemel. Jumpstart Philly is a unique community development program that trains, mentors, networks, and provides funding to aspiring real estate developers in seven different Philadelphia neighborhoods, including Germantown, where the program was founded. Jumpstart believes that you can do well by doing good and focuses on removing neighborhood blight, scattered site rehab, creating a healthy mix of affordable and market rate housing, and avoiding gentrification through slow, steady growth and keeping wealth local. Interviews for the program are conducted during Jumpstart Germantown's weekly Jump in Our series, held Monday nights at 7 p.m. with Zoom webinar. And for more information about these events, check out the events page at jumpstartgermantown.com. This week, I got to speak with Julia Choseed, who is a seasoned developer and licensed contractor, about con- construction management and her tips for ensuring that your project gets done right. I hope you enjoy the conversation, and be sure to check out the podcast version of this program at jumpstartgermantown.com slash media. Um, but yeah, so I'll kick things off, and I'm just going to read a short bio for Julia, and we'll jump into the conversation. Um, and Julia Choseed is the founder of Brickhouse Builders, which is a real estate development company that focuses on investing in Philadelphia's Strawberry Mansion neighborhood. In 2016, Julia purchased her first property with $11 in her bank account and quit her job on the same day. Since then, she's developed millions in real estate and throughout her career has successfully, or throughout her successful career in real estate, Julia has flipped, rented, rented, wholesaled, designed, GC'd and other investors projects and until she ultimately found that her passion lies in design and mentorship. So in addition to offering design services and investor consultations, she also uh, develops and teaches a comprehensive accelerated construction management certification course in conjunction with uh, Better Than Success that also offers uh, or that is offered three times a year. So it's my pleasure to introduce her tonight and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Julia. How are you doing? Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And you like drop the all-star panel. It feels like a different lifetime so yeah. long ago. Yeah. But uh, I, I forgot that that even happened. But I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'll just jump right in the, into the question. And this can kind of serve as, as your background. Uh, I'm going to start off think or asking you about you know how you got started and stuff and why don't you just tell me how where where's the first time you thought about real estate and uh, and how did you get started in this uh, development world yeah so I was um, I think I was in high school and I somehow came across the book I just want to say like I feel like so many real estate investors and developers have the same exact story um, which has to say something right um, okay. but I picked up the book rich dad poor dad completely changed the way I thought about money and business and and being an employee. Um, and from there on out, I was like, I want to own businesses. I want to be an investor. Um, and I kind of started to tap into any resource that was I could get my hands on when it came to investing um, and entrepreneurship. So, you know, at that time, bigger pockets had, you know, just started to really make a big presence online. So I was like listening to their podcast and um, joined the blogs and was finding meetups and would send a message to anybody who had a real estate investing title in the Philadelphia area. And I'd ask them to go to coffee and, and this you know, was, all those this Dan was, Merrill webinars. Go ahead. Sorry. While you were in high school, right? I, or, or, or were you, you that invested? That was kind of like when the seed was planted. And then over the next few years, it like really started to grow. And, you know, when I was in college, I was waitressing and um, this woman um, I was up in New Brunswick, so I went to Rutgers and, you know, this woman came in and she um, had a real estate book and, you know, she ended up being one of my regulars and she was studying for her real estate exam and she started inviting me to some of, you know, the investor meetups up there and she really wanted to be a real estate investor too. And, um, you know, that was in maybe 2014 ish. Um, and like fast forward a few years, she ended up being one of my private investors on a flip that I did. Um, cool. but yeah, that's really like where it all started and just yeah. where the hunger came from. Cool. Yeah. And then where did, or at what point did you realize, real, really realize that like, this is a career path that you could go down. This was like a, a it wasn't just a thing that you could listen to podcasts out and be excited about it. When did you realize that it became like your, your, your thing? I mean, it took it took a little while to like really build up enough 
like courage and, you know, be confident in the idea of being a real estate investor. But, um, you know, I had spent years like just studying and just trying to convince myself that this was a possibility for someone like me. Um, and then, you know, I was doing all of the right things. Like I went to college and I got a job and, um, you know, I was just kind of like trying to do whatever my parents thought was best for me at the time. Um, and then I like had this revelation. I'm like, in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, working at this job that I hated. And I was like, is this forever? <laughs> and, you know, from there, I was like, I really just have to take a chance on myself. And um, I had made the decision that I wanted to, to buy a property. And I reached out to a lender and got my pre-approval um, mm -hmm. and, you know, spent all of my free time driving to Philly and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, where and what I wanted to start with. Awesome. Yeah. And, and um, you started in one thing that I'm hoping you can introduce us to, to tonight. And I'm sure everybody has, has heard the term. Um, and I've heard you say it a couple of times in our prep session. Um, it's, it's house hacking. And you, you kind of you set that up as that's like what really kicked things all off for you. So why don't you just start simple and tell us what is how what is house hacking? Yeah, so house hacking is, you know, pretty much turning your home into an income producing property. Um, so this can be done in so many different ways. Um, you know, the way I, I originally wanted to do that, you know, owner occupied triplex or quad with a conventional loan, you know, it's like the cream puff first deal. Um, and, you know, I, kept looking for a multifamily home to be owner occupied. That was like move in ready. And I just couldn't, I couldn't find it. And I was like getting so incredibly uncomfortable at my job. And I was like, I have to buy something and I have to get started. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up buying a single family home that I like fell in love with. And I had, it was a three bedroom. I like lived in the smallest bedroom because I knew like people would pay more and they were like more interested in living in a nicer bedroom. So um, before I even went to closing, I had the other two bedrooms rented out and I had one bedroom rented out for 550 and one for 650 utilities included. Um, and my mortgage payment was I think $710. So mm -hmm. right off the bat, I went from like paying $1,000 a month in rent somewhere to now having a home that I lived in for free that actually cash flowed a few hundred dollars. So like my I was able to pay for utilities, you know, maybe some groceries or whatever. Um, but, you know, from there, I've used a few different strategies when it comes to house hacking. So another creative way would be to, you know, rent a house for, you know, I rented a, a five it was a five bedroom house. Um, I rented it for like $2,000. And then I rented out each bedroom to, again, like some of my friends. And I like managed the house because I collected their rent and then paid the landlord rent. Um, but I lived in the basement for free while I rented out all the other bedrooms. Right. And then from there, I bought a triplex and, you know, now I'm living in one unit and renting out the other two. And then to take it to like another level, I like, Airbnb the guest bedroom. So it's like trying to like cap like yeah. get cash flow in every angle possible. And you know, I like to as I grow in, you know, my investing career to like use that same strategy with vacation homes. You know, yeah. I'd like to buy maybe a beach house or a mountain house. And like when I'm not there, run it out so that the house is being paid for. And now I have an asset that I get to enjoy as well. But mm. you know, it's kind of always trying to, you know, get as much income on a property as possible. Yeah, sure. So you said, and, and you kind of teased it there in the in that last answer um, about what the scale of development you you started at and where you're at now. Um, and it's not, your first purchase. It sounds like was a single family home, right? And then and then you you said you we were just talking before, and now you're working on a five unit property. So well, what happened in between there? How <laughs> It's been a crazy five years. So Monday is that like my anniversary of buying my first property is like more important to me than like my birthday or any other thing. It's like such a big deal. It's like I still to this day cannot believe that like I did that. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so I just hit five years and, you know, it's been the craziest five years I could have ever imagined. And I started I started with no money. I started like in the single family home. Um, and at that point, I was just like really just willing to do whatever it takes and like um, I was showing up to the sheriff sales to try to wholesale properties to other investors um, you know I got my GC license and um, you know I got a few properties so within a few months of moving to Philly and buying that home I got two properties under contract that I was going to flip mm -hmm. and you know at that point I had like no idea if it, if it was going to work right I'd like I'd never seen it in like no one in, in my life had ever 
done that. Right. So I like, I'm trying to immerse myself in like the knowledge and experience of others. And I'm, but I still like, didn't know it was actually possible for me. Um, so the whole time I'm like, is this working? Is this working? Is this working? And like, um, I, the whole first project, the way I like told myself was like, I just spent like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on a college degree that I won't ever use. Mm -hmm. So like, if I buy this property and get it from start to finish, I'm now going to have all of the knowledge that I need to get a property from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And if that costs me a little bit of money, so be it. Now I have all of the education. Um, So that's like how I went into it in the beginning. I was just like, I just want to learn everything. I want to be a sponge. Um, Mm -hmm. And turns out like, I ended up making, that was like the most profitable deal I ever had to this day. It was my first deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's kind of like where things started. And I flipped a few properties over the first few years. And I, um, what I would do is I would have private investors lend money that I would use to, to like down payment a construction loan or a bank loan. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you about next is what sources of uh, financing did you use like in the beginning compared to now? Um, you said you, you went to a lender. Was that a, was that just a traditional bank that gave you your first loan? So my it was. So I started with um, Spring Garden Lending and, you know, I was like this little newbie that had no portfolio or no experience. And I had they made me write them an essay on like why I was qualified for this loan and they like met had to meet me in person and um you know it, I really had to like sell myself on like why I was good enough to lend to um and you know I had done I had to do that with a hard money banker too which was like the same thing it was like these dudes own this this company and like you know they're like why should we lend to you you've never done this before and I'm like <laughs> It sounds like they weren't really looking at the project. They were looking at you more so. They were looking at me. And then, of course, like I I showed up to this meeting with like, you know, the MLS listing um, for the ones that were on the MLS and like my analyses of the property and like, you know, um, my study of the neighborhood and like all all the research that I possibly could come up with. I really like wanted to sit down and sell it, like sell the deal to them. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, so we should probably, the, the name of the jump in our is construction management. So should we should probably talk about construction? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, you are a general contractor and you, you do that side of things on your own. Um, so I want to ask you how you got involved with the contracting side of things, as opposed to, you know, um, just being like the developer who, who's financing the project. Yeah, of course. So that was never like my initial plan to like be a general contractor. I was like, I want to build houses when I grow up. I was like, I want to be a real estate investor when I grew up. And, you know, I bought this this first property and knew nothing about construction. Um, And, you know, I had I had a partner for a little bit in the beginning and, you know, he had taken the reins on construction and I, you know, was absorbing as much as possible, figuring all the, like trying to figure out all the ways that like he wasn't doing things to, you know, the, to be most productive. And, um, you know, I fell in love with construction and like project management. And like, I, you know, I studied organizational leadership in college and like, I really like. That's that's (laughs) not for my major. So I I get. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm like, you know, give me a job site and I want to like coordinate everything and organize and put people and orders and find the most efficient ways to do things. Um, and, you know, it's really like fascinating watching a property transform and like to understand, like, I've always been someone who like wants to know how things work. Right. So like now you're taking a house and you're completely deconstructing it to nothing and rebuilding it. And just the process in itself is like incredible. Yeah. Um, so I fell in love with it. And, you know, from there, that's when, you know, it, it's pretty, it's pretty simple to become a licensed general contractor. You take your OSHA 30 and you pay your fees and you get insurance and you're a contractor. Um, so, so I did that pretty yeah. early on. Was it just like on the next contractor or on the next project you like were, were setting up to choose a contractor and you're like, I'm just going to do it myself. Screw it. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it was pretty early on when I started the construction company. And, you know, I know we're going to really focus on construction, but I feel like, you know, how I got started is so important. But in the beginning, like two, I, I told myself I was going to, I needed to abide by two rules. I was like, no partners and no clients. You know, like the reason I'm doing this is to like work for myself and to build, you know, build this thing for myself. And like, I broke both of those rules, like right off the bat. And like both of them really like came back to haunt me for a long time. Um, but, you know, so I was doing general construction for a few other developers for a short period of time, um, you know, and found out really quick that that's not for me. Um, but, you know, once, um, once I did those first few projects and I was able to, you know, build this system of construction from A to Z, right? Like, so I was just like taking notes the whole time in the big beginning. I was like, who's the first person that I call? Where do I start? It's like, I have this house. Where do I start? And like, you learn like all the things like just from the experience. And it's like, oh, so I should have called PGW first, you know, just like random things that like, completely can wreck your project right. like i now those are things that probably aren't even highlighted too much in like the normal um you know construction education you know whether you, if you go to college for something like that or, or oh, absolutely not no the, the only way you're gonna learn them learn that is on the job so so might as well just try it right <laughs> right and like another thing is like so to be a general contractor you have to take your osha 30 and so that's like 30 hours of osha training and nearly none of the information that you learn in this class is relevant to like residential construction. Yeah. Like we're learning about like, there's some of the stuff is good because it's like, like hazardous, like, you know, construction debris and things like that. But most of it is like not applicable to, you know, our job sites that we deal with. If you're just tuning in, this is a conversation with Julia Chosied, a seasoned developer and licensed contractor about construction management. Thank you for listening to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show on Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. I hope you enjoy the discussion. Well, then how did um, Brickhouse Investments begin? Because that's your business, right? Yep. So that was the first company. So Brickhouse Builders was, you know, a byproduct of Brickhouse Investments. Um, so I started Brickhouse Investments before I even purchased my first home. Um, and, you know, that was the goal was to like buy and hold real estate. And then as I realized I wanted to get into construction, I was like, well, I'm already Brickhouse. So Brickhouse Builders has a really nice ring to it. <laughs> So we're, we're just going to do this. We're now Brickhouse Builders too. <laughs> All right. So let's hear how uh, Brickhouse Builders does things. And uh, I want to talk about the construction process. Um, one thing that, or a term that you brought up earlier that, that is clearly very important to you is project management. Um, and why don't you explain to me, like, how is project management different than like the umbrella construction management term um, and how important is it? Yeah, I mean, it is literally the most important thing. So I know we talked about this a little bit and I I say it all the time. It's like, you could know everything about construction and still be an awful project manager or an awful real estate investor for that matter. Um, so, you know, I, for, like someone who had no experience in construction, I'm now like, you know, what I'd like to think a really great construction project manager, you know, because there's just like systems and organization tactics that you, you know utilize that um, are gonna like be the primary source of success in a project. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what that looks like is, you know, I use um, a scope of work and a budget. And those are like the two most important documents for me in a project. And my scope of work is actually, you know, not what you'd think in, in the sense of, um, you know, a summary or like paragraphs or any kind of report. It's literally like an Excel sheet with a list of like all of the things that I have to do. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite things that I learned from Jumpstart Germantown is um, having a contingency, right? So like, that's something that like can always really stressed. And like, if you ever made a budget, you better have that extra line item at the bottom with like a 10% or 15% contingency, I think it was. Um, so, you know, at the, whether it's a new construction or rehab, it's like that thing's like my Bible. It's like, okay, so what is my first step? So it's like, if it's a lot, it's like a clean out and then it's ex excavation. Um, and, 
you know, for me, what the most important thing about construction project management um, is to always be two steps ahead at all times. So if you are, um, if you bought a house and, um, you know, the first thing you do is you need to hire an architect um, and you need to get the property cleaned out and demoed. So like as soon as like you're doing the demo, you want to be talking to framers. You want to be, you know, getting a takeoff put together for your lumber material. Like as the property is, you know, being framed up, you want to be talking to your plumbers and your electricians and, you know, every, every good contractor is going to be on average about two weeks behind, like two weeks before they can get to your project. Um, all of all material has lead times too. So when you order your kitchens, um, you want to have your con con kitchens designed because on best case scenario, you may be looking at a week or two weeks for your kitchen. Sometimes, it can be a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to like wait till you get to the phase and then do kitchens because now you're sitting vacant for two weeks. And imagine if like now your kitchen's in and then you're then hiring the next person who's going to like the amount of vacancy that can build up. And, you know, vacancy means holding costs, utilities, mm -hmm. interests, um, maybe you're now like missing out on getting your property on the market at the right time. Like all of these things like really are important part of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really like the most important part of project management. Yeah, sure. So is project manager synonymous with general contractor or like, cause I'm thinking of a scenario where you could be a developer, but not the general contractor. Would you, could you still call yourself the project manager, even though you're not doing the general contractor contract? Like, like, it sounds like the project manager is the, is the person who should have all the answers to all the questions anybody has about the project, right? <laughs> um, so, so if you're the developer, should you also know that on top of the general contractor knowing that? What, what's that relationship like? I mean, yeah. you because you're um, yeah. So, like for me, um, I've always been the owner, the developer, the contractor, like on all of my deals. So, mm -hmm. you know, I refer to me unfortunately when these things <laughs> go wrong right you don't even really have a frame of reference for for that sort of relationship so that sounds like advice to become a general contractor right <laughs> yeah so you know like i for a short period was a general contractor for another developer which was like you know a pretty cool experience is you know it it wasn't like the best that the best decision that I had ever made for my career but you know i got to like kind of see now like this big developer it went from being a GC and managing their own projects to hiring someone who is me. So now like they had a project manager awesome. who, so it was like developer, project manager, me. And I reported to the project manager who reported to the developer. Um, Sounds like you can cut out a lot of those levels by just doing what you're doing and doing it yourself. Yeah. And like, it really like, it's such a like it's there's so much leverage in that when you're new when you maybe don't have capital when you um you know don't want to have partners like there is like so much power in being able to like wear all the hats and make all the decision you can make more money you can like you know for me i didn't have capital and i like how can i be an investor without capital right so like the best thing that i was able to do was to you know, leverage private investors and leverage partners. And then I had to do everything else to like pull my weight, right? Until I did start to build capital and be able to like kind of start cutting out these people. I'm um, like, I was talking earlier, it's like, you know, my first few deals, I had both partners and private investors, you know? So like, there's not, there wasn't very much room for me, but I was doing all of the work ultimately. And now it's like, I have a five unit building that I have no partners on that I have no investors on. And like, it's pretty cool. Cool. Yeah. So uh, before we, we move on, I just want to remind everybody that uh, we're having a Q&A session at the end of our conversations, probably in about 15, 20 minutes. Um, you can enter those in using the Q&A in our chat or, or in the uh, toolbar there, and we'll get to them when we get to them. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So so I want to hop to something that you mentioned as, as one of two very important parts of project management. There was the scope of work and the budget management. Um, so we'll, we'll get the scope of work, but why don't you start by telling me a little bit about budget management and uh, and how important that is and what that means other than just, you know, putting a line item numbers in, in a sheet and calling it a day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, so you're, you know, as investors, the most important, like we do this for the numbers, right? Like, 
have to remember, I'm like, I'm not doing this as a hobby. Like this is, <laughs> it, it comes down to the numbers. And that's the beautiful thing about real estate investing is like, it's all about the numbers. So, you know, one of the main numbers in real estate is like a construction budget. Um, so it's important to be, you know, as accurate as possible and to have that contingency. Um, so, you know, for me at this point, I like one, the best way to know how much things cost is to like, have the experience of doing the thing, right? So, um, you know, I when I got through a project from you know A to Z by myself, I made sure to you know utilize QuickBooks and have a report, knowing that like every single line item and what it costs. So I had done a triplex, and um, I had a report of how much plumbing fixtures cost, how much the demo cost, like every line item. So then when I bought a four unit building, I just multiplied everything by 125 or whatever, you know, to make it. And then I added a little bit because, you know, maybe there's a premium for going, um, you know, so, to four units. So what about when uh, the condition of the property is different than the last one? Do you like, how much does that uh, dollar amount fluctuate, I guess, or, or do you just simply multiply it by four? No. So a lot of the things are pretty straightforward. So like when it comes to like electric and plumbing, like that stuff isn't going to change too much. What you're going to see a lot of. Yeah. Like, like no matter what the condition of the property, there's certain things that are just going to, you know, how much they cost. Right. Right. But like your big uh, line items that are going to vary a lot, depending on the scope of work or like your, like all the structural stuff. So when it comes to framing and masonry, like, are you doing a roof deck? No. How, what's the condition of the roof? Like um, I've had, you know, properties with, um, you know, you open the door and you can see the, the sky. <laughs> and then I just bought this five unit, like, the roof had just been done and like, I didn't really have to do much roof work to it except seal the penetrations from like the mechanicals that I did. Um, so, you know, things like that are important to pay attention to. And, you know, I, you know, early on I had two, three units and I was like, Oh, that one costs, you know, 250,000. This one's going to cost 250,000. And like right off the bat, one of the first things that we do is like the roof. And like this other one had like, eight roofs like there's like bays and like porches like the the property just had so much going on that i like didn't even know at that point to like oh well now there's not just a flat roof now yeah. there's like all different kinds of stuff that i need this roofer to do but the more projects you do the more reference you have i guess so so you know now you, it sounds like you're probably on what your fifth or sixth property right um, um so my portfolio currently has, um, I just sold a property last week. So I have four properties, but I've done probably about 30 projects. Okay, cool. I was way lowballing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So that's budget management. Now, why don't we talk about scope of work? Um, you know, what you said that is kind of like the, the step-by-step -step guide walking you through the project detail by detail. Um, should it be like a book or should it be like an organized spreadsheet? What, what does usually that like physically look like for you? Yeah, for me, like my scope of work actually is like the same document that my budget is. Okay. Right. Yep. So it's kind of, and like, um, you know, sometimes I make some notes, but you know, in the beginning of the project there, you're going to get an understanding of like what you're up against, but there's also so much to be learned when you take the walls down. Right. So, um, my first project, I always like think back to this. Cause I was like, I, I can do this for like 40,000. <laughs> the property cost $110,000 to renovate. Yeah. So I like little naive me, like knew nothing about how much things cost. And, you know, we demoed the property and all, every, it's like a Philly row home typical. So like all of the doors and windows, like the brick was like collapsing above and like we needed to do new lentils. And at that point I didn't even know what a lentil was. So I learned real quick after dishing out five grand or whatever it was like, all right, so now going forward, I know to pay attention to like this thing that I will probably have to do because all most Philly row homes are like pretty right. similar to the next, you right. know? Yeah. So, and I'm sure that helps doing the scope of work hand in hand with the budget. Cause you can kind of know where like, there's probably discretionary things like, Oh, should I add this extra expensive feature? And then you have the reference, right? Cause the, the number should be right there with it. Yeah. Cool. All right, cool. Um, so we'll, we'll leave some time for Q and a cause uh, we, we have some piling up here. Uh, but 
I just have one last little section of questions to ask you, and it's about being a general contractor. Um, and, and you already had stated it, but maybe you can restate it. Um, what is being the general contractor, and what does that mean, like for the project? Yeah. So, like, what my day to day look day looks like um, is, you know, I'm not necessarily like doing any physical work myself, but what I'm doing is, um, you know, I subcontract everything out. So I have a framer who has a framing company. So I'm coordinating and scheduling with one person who has a whole crew working for him. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing for my, all, like all of my trades. So you're dealing with like your Mason, your framer, your plumber, your electrician, your HVAC crew, your drywall crew, your finished carpentry, mm -hmm. um, your floor, you know, there's like a lot of people that you're going to be managing throughout the project. Um, so I am managing them and I'm designing the project, picking up material, ordering material, making sure it's there on site, um, you know, problem solving. Um, one thing that I'll say is like the, you know, the best part about being a general contractor and acting as the project manager for your real estate investments um, is to have all of that control, right? So like I get to control the schedule for the most part and I get to control the cost of things. So when, you know, I have to order drywall or like we'll say framing material. So I have a set of plans. I'm sending that to multiple different vendors. So maybe, you know, vendors that I've used is like Shelly's, um, CNR, um, what's another one like tag. So I have, I have contacts at all of these companies and I send them an email and be like, can you do a takeoff, um, for lumber? And they might have a few questions of like, you know, um, what are you doing in this, in this room? Um, and, you know, I get to shop and make sure I'm getting the best price on material. Mm -hmm. um, but also, so like if you hire a GC and like for people who have like heard me talk before, it's like, this is one of my favorite things to say. It's like a lot of the times you GC your GC, right? Mm -hmm. So like you hire someone to do the management, but then like, you're like, where, you know, drywall is supposed to be Monday, where's drywall? And then you're like, kind of like trying to manage this person who right. you have no control over anything they're controlling right because mm -hmm. they're now the ones that are talking to the drywall contractor talking to the all like the mechanical contractors when it could just be like give me the guy's number i'll call him i need to find out when this is going on you know so mm -hmm. um you know and there's still you know construction the construction industry is like there's delays on every single thing and nothing ever goes to plan and that's just something that you need to expect and prepare for in construction um but you at least like get to have your hands in th those decisions that are being made yeah yeah it sounds like you're, you're involved in everything but you're not doing everything <laughs> right uh, and you know so i talked a little bit about like the big advantage of doing it and like the hardest part about doing it is um you know there are often things that are like not necessarily anybody's job. <laughs> so you hire like all of these crews to do something and like everybody has one job and they're like the Mason is doing masonry and the framer is doing framing. And it's like, everybody is kind of like that same story. And then like small things will pop up or you have to fix something. And like, you know, I really struggle with not having like someone who's full time that can just fill in the gaps everywhere. You know, and like, you know, sometimes if I'm feeling really like ambitious, I'll try to fill in the gaps, right? Like, oh, well, it's just a doorknob. Let me like pull up a, let me pull up a YouTube and like figure out how to install this doorknob real quick. <laughs> I had to do that today. I like, I told the tenant, I was like, yeah, um, be a little patient. I've never installed a doorknob. So I'll be right here with YouTube, but I'll get it done for you. Don't worry. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, cool. Well, um, I think that wraps up the questions I have for you. Um, maybe before we move to Q&A, do you want to talk about, about your, your own sort of uh, mentor uh, educational thing you got going on? Yeah. So, you know, a few things that I want to talk about is like um, how my career has evolved. So, you know, in the beginning, I was kind of like figuring out what worked for me. I was doing some wholesaling. I was doing some, you know, house hacking in a few different ways and GCing and all the other things. And like over the last five years, what that has progressed is, 
you know, I, I love designing homes and I started an interior design company last year. Um, and I also this past year started an environmental testing company. So what that means is, you know, we're, do, we're mostly doing lead, lead dust testing for landlords in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia um, just recently changed the code that like any building pretty much built before I think it's 1980, like has to get lead dust tested to get your rental license. So that's something that I also offer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also, the last few years, um, in conjunction with the Better Than Success Real Estate League, and that was like, it's such a tongue twister. It's like the Comprehensive Construction Accelerated Management course. <laughs> um, but we teach that class um, typically twice a year. Um, and we're going to be teaching a class this September. So this class, um, you know, it's a four week, it's a four week class um, from, from every Saturday. And we start um, from project management and leadership skills, important to being a real estate investor, to all of the pre-development, um, managing architects and zoning and what that looks like with navigating, you know, all of the, you know, administrative stuff to a, to a development deal, to then like a step-by-step -step blueprint to managing your construction site. So I kind of like went through a little bit like, what, where do you start? What's number one? So like, you're going to do your demo and then your masonry and then your framing. So we go through all of that, um, you know, and also touch on like design and, um, you know, a little bit of like analyzing, you know, your deal. So pretty much everything A to Z. So we teach that class. Um, it's in September. Um, there is for everybody here, there's a custom link just for you guys to get a discount on the class. Um, someone put it in the, in the chat. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, but if you want design services, lead dust testing, or to sign up for this class, uh, you can, you can reach out to me. I was telling, um, uh, we were talking about this the other day, like um, Instagram is like the best way to reach me to keep up with what I'm doing. Okay. I'm pretty active. I talk about my projects. I try to teach things, um, you know, things that I learn along the way. And I always people send me messages with questions and I do a pretty a ton of job. But what is your Instagram so I can put it in the chat? <laughs> do it. It's uh, for cast builders. <laughs> builders. All right. So be sure to follow Julia on Instagram. And <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Yeah, sure. And use that code uh, jumpstart for the 30% off discount for the construction management class. But thank you, Julia. I, I'm sure everybody really appreciates that. And that concludes my conversation with licensed contractor and experienced developer Julia Chosi about her tips for construction management. Next week, tune in to hear my conversation with a retired environmental engineer, Kelly O'Day, about floodplain issues and the due diligence required to protect your investment property and community from flash flooding. The interviews on this program are recorded during Jumpstart Germantown's weekly Jumpinar series, which takes place via Zoom webinar every Monday night at 7 p.m. If you'd like to participate in the live Q&A with our guest, be sure to head to jumpstartgermantown.com events and register for next week's Jumpinar. And if you're interested in starting a Jumpstart program in your own community, visit gojumpstart.org and see our how-to guide and open source training workbook. Thank you so much for listening to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show on Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. And be sure to tune in next week.